Hi guys, so today we are in the historical market town of Melbourne in Derbyshire, not Melbourne in Australia. And Melbourne is famous for the birthplace of Thomas Cook, the travel age, and also Melbourne Hall, where we will be visiting later today. Along the route, we're going to go to Cork Abbey, then to Breeding on the Hill, before heading back to Melbourne. Today's route is just under 10 miles, and like always, plenty of sea, so let's get going. In 1311, the Duke of Lancaster granted Robert Holland the right to build a fortification or to add military fortifications to an existing building. Robert used the license to fortify the old royal manor house and create Melbourne Castle. After the Battle of Agincourt in 1415, Jean Duke de Bourbon was held prisoner in the castle for 19 years. It was one of the sites considered as, as a prison for Mary, Queen of Scots. 150 years later, but by that time it had deteriorated into such a poor state that it was not deemed suitable for a royal prisoner. Where Mary Queen of Scots was imprisoned can be seen in one of my previous videos, Best Hardwick Ranked to Riches, which I'll leave a link to here. The castle was enlarged in 1483. In 1604, the Crown sold it to the Earl of Huntington and the Earl tore it down in 1637. Part of the castle walls are within this garden here. Also, the wall of this garden is part of the castle walls. Thomas Cook's birth home. The Thomas Cook Elm Houses were built in 1891 for the famous travel agent who was born in 1808 in Melbourne. He was raised as a strict Baptist and he was a part of the temperance movement. He moved to Market Harbour in 1832, where after walking from the market town to Leicester for a temperance meeting, came up with the idea of travel excursions first by train, which included a tour of Scotland and to the Great Expedition in London in 1851, then arranged excursions abroad four years later which went through Belgium, Germany and France, finishing in Paris. Thomas Cook opened a store in Leicester on Gallatry Gate. Within the stonework of the building, stonemasons have sculptured forms of travels back in the 1800s. Unfortunately, this travel agent went into administration last year, but over the central window is an inscription reading Memorial House of Call for Mr Cook and Invited Friends. Along the route today, we'll be passing Harold Stoughton Reservoir, then going to the Lime Kilns, and then to Cork Abbey. After that, passing St Giles, and then up to Cork, onto the Ivanhoe Way, then up to Breeding on the Hill. Pa after passing the Iron Age Fort, we'll head down to Park Pale, and then back into Melbourne, passing Melbourne Hall along the way. This is Tower Windmill. Originally, this observation tower started out as a windmill, built in 1798 for Lord Melbourne, at a cost of 250 pounds to mill grain. By the 19th century, it became derelict. It was then converted to be an observation tower, although never finished or used for its purpose, but the structure is now grade two listed. This is Stoughton Harold Reservoir. The reservoir sits on 209 acres, 
managed by Severn Trent Water, surrounding it are many walking trails, a visitor centre and is used for water sports, in particular sailing. We're going to head down to Cork Abbey and past the ancient lime kilns and that's where we're heading to next as we walk alongside the reservoir. The structures you can see are old lime kilns. They were used to burn crushed limestone using coal as a fuel. This process broke up the rock, which could then be used as a fertilizer, whitewash paint, and as a mortar. There is evidence that lime has been burnt from this site since the Roman times. Fringstone Fault crosses the parish of Ticknell from east to west, separating the coal measures of clay of the south from the upthrust carbon ferrous limestone to the north. Other than here, limestone can only be found in three other places in the area, one which we'll be visiting later on at Breeden. Imagine the smoke, rime and dust filling the air. The material was corrosive and many workers suffered burns and lung problems. They were used to burn crushed limestone using coal and adding sand and water. It could be used as mortar to bond bricks together and create stronger walls. By the 18th century, they used coke or coal to raise the temperature of the fires and heat the limestone up more, causing a higher purity. The lime kilns here became the largest site in the Midlands until its decrease in 1915 when the kilns were closed. The path we're walking on now is called the Ticknell Tramway. 12 mile tramway that led from the coal fields and lime yards to Ashby Canal. The tramway operated from 1802 to 1913. We're coming to a tunnel now, and this is one of three tunnels across the Cork Abbey Estate. This one is being opened by the National Trust for pedestrians to walk in now. The tunnel is eight foot wide and about six feet high in places uh, and that means I've got to bend over because I'm taller than that. The tunnel was built in 1805. It linked these line works at Ticknell with the canal at Ashby de la Zulch. It was easier and cheaper to construct 
and the alternative approach method, a canal. The line consisted of L-shaped three foot long iron trams that lay to a gorge of four foot two inches. Several routes were considered in an attempt to avoid crossing the carriage drive to Cork Abbey, but the problem was finally overcome by the construction of this cut and cover tunnel. The line was last used in 1913 and officially closed in 1915. They look a bit horny. Oh, that's because of long haul cattle. Where are these young bullocks? Having a little bit of a play, bumping in. Where are their heads? Heads are locked. I don't think they like being filmed. So we'll better carry on. Although I am wearing red today, so maybe they're going to stampede me in a moment. As we continue walking along the National Forest Way towards Kalkabi, on our right we have Betty's Pond. Ooh, Betty! Kalkabi is a Grade 1 listed property with extensive grounds and a large stable block and now in the care of the National Trust. The site was, a, the site was an Augustian priory from the 12th century until the dissolution of monasteries by Henry VIII between 1536 and 1541. A Baroque mansion was built in 1701 for the Harper family who in 1808 built the present structure of Kalkabi although, as mentioned, was only a priory and never an abbey. The Harper Crew family owned the property for over 300 years until 1985, where it was passed to the National Trust in lieu of death duties, of which extended to an £8 million debt. The house is now open to the public. Some of the rooms have been left in a state of decline as how the Trust received the property. St Giles was the parish church from 1160 to 1834. It then became the private manor chapel to the Harper Cruise family of Calcabi. See on our left hand side, it's called the Fats Cottage. I wonder why it's got its name. It's a 17th century cottage. It's full of character and has low ceiling beams. And if you like to rent it out, you can do through the National Trust. And on our right, we have the old schoolhouse. Anyway, we're going to carry on walking this way and we're going to head onto the Ivanhoe Way. The Gables. Unlike last week's walk, we've crossed the border again, or will be in a couple of metres. We're out to Derbyshire, so we're into Leicestershire now. We're on the Ivanhoe Way now. The path is a long distance path 
although only 35 miles long, that stretches over the northwestern part of Leicestershire and the Charnwood Forest. Named after the novel by Sir Walter Scott called Ivanhoe, written in 1819 in the local area. Well, I would guess he's only maybe a couple of days old. Oh, and there's another one over there. He's got a coat. So earlier we were in Melbourne, but not the Melbourne in Australia. And now we're coming to Scotland. But again, not the Scotland north of the border, not the Isle of Scotland. Well, it's not an island, but I'm sure if the First Minister gets her way, she will change it to an island. Okay, answers on the postcard, which I know what he's doing other than sticking his teeth on a piece of wood. It's like, I think it's belching. Obviously he's scratching his head now. He's a muscular lad. Probably runs in some races. So I don't know if he's bringing up here or something. Or stretching his strong muscular jaw. Anyway, we best keep going. So on the top is breeding on the hill from the church. I'll talk a little bit more about it when we reach there. So beforehand, we're going across this golf course and then we're going into the village of Breeden. Just thought I might do tip of the day. Now, this week's tip is about trying on footwear. So if you want to buy some outdoor footwear, then I suggest going to a good outdoor shop. At the time you want to go, it's between 4 and 6 p.m. The reason why I say that is because throughout the day, when you're walking around, your feet are spreading out and they swell up. So you want to try and appear boots when your feet are at the biggest. Now the next thing I would say is when you go to one of these walking shops, if you're buying walking boots or walking shoes, trail runners or any outdoor footwear, just take a pair of your socks. Because if you don't, now a walking shop will say, yeah, we can let you borrow a pair of socks. But just think, when was the last time they washed them socks? How many people have tried them socks on? And you're going to put your feet in them as well? I would suggest take your own walking socks. A lot of walkers have different type of socks. Uh, you might use something like merino wool, smart wool, or you may like a more elasticated synthetic type sock. Some are thinner and some are thicker. Depends what season you're walking in and what type of boots you're getting. So what socks you put on may actually determine how the, the boots will fit. So my tips are, when going to a shop, go between 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. when your feet are swollen up throughout the day. So take a pair of your own walking socks. And the other thing is, when you're trying them on, get to walk around the shop. Some outdoor shops have like an area that you can walk on, like a stony area. Try that out. You want to see that the boots fit you. What I mean by that is, so obviously if you were going downhill, then you want to feel that your toes aren't just getting squashed into the boot. And again, if you're walking uphill, it's got good ankle support. If you're buying a mid or a full boot, the type of boot you go for is entirely up to yourself. So I'll leave that up to you, but that is tip of the day. Put a comment. So what type of footwear do you like to wear when you go out in the outdoors? Now, I understand that most people, unless you're wearing slippers, you're going to be wearing them outdoors. But what I mean is out in the countryside. If you're going hiking or backpacking or whatever your, your activity is, what type of footwear do you wear? So we just reached Breeden. As you can see, just at the top of the hill is just the tower of the church just popping up. In front of us, we have a memorial to uh, the First World War. Well, this is an interesting cottage. It's the door. So the door is about five feet tall. It's on six foot four. Hell knows how we're getting in that house. Well, that's certainly a slim looking house. It's probably about 10 foot wide. If that, maybe eight foot. In front, we have an 18th century lockup. Now this used to be to lock up the local drunks and any wandering cattle that got lost.
In front we have Breeden Hall. Breeden Hall is a historical building from 1620, which was the ancestral home of the Couzon family for three centuries. The Couzon family also owned Kettleton Hall near Derby and have done since 1297. The National Trust took over the property after death duties in the 1970s as the property cost too much to maintain. The Couzon family still live in the property in the family wing of 23 rooms, agreement that was made with the family and the trust. Now the, this place, Breeden Hall, is now a, um, I believe it's a bed and breakfast. So we're now heading up Breeden Hill to the church. This is the rear view of Breeden Hall. At the top of the hill stood the Bulwark, an Iron Age hill fort, believed to be built in the second century before Christ. The name of the hill derives from the Celtic word for hill, brie, and the Old English word of dun, meaning hill. Medieval records show that four saints have been buried on the hill. I may not pronounce these correctly. Fridicurus of the seventh century, King Eardwolf of Northumbria, and Anglo-Saxons Biona and Cotter. So the Priory Church of St Mary and St Hardolf. The church has also been known as the Breeden Priory and as the Holy Hill Monastery. Found as a monastery in the 7th century, it contains some of the finest examples of Anglo-Saxon sculptures. Unfortunately it's not open so we can't take a look inside. The Shirley family brought the manor of Breeden after it was surrendered to the crown in 1539. During the dissolution of the monasteries, one of the monuments, the largest, is for Sir George Shirley, made in 1598. It was made over 20 years before his death and includes a life-size carved skeleton. The monument stands on three tombs on top of each other. The base is the skeleton, the second story it has six pillars and has George Shirley kneeling as he prays with his sons and the top story a further six pillars and incorporates the family coat of arms. The monument is made of a soft stone from either Italy or Egypt. Thomas Mallards was born the second day of June 1656. He died the 28th day of April in 1710. Thomas Shakespeare, fourth son of John and Martha Shakespeare. He was born at the 8th of April 1779 and died on the 30th of September 1849. John Shakespeare, 1786. As I've noticed, a lot of these graves are from around the 16 and 1700s, all the way up to about the 1800s. I'm sure there may be a few before that. Looking through the window into the church. So this is the grave of Robert Couzon, member of the Couzon family from the local area, and he died in 1873, aged 37 years. Noticing this grave, a smaller grave, the actual top part has been moved off its base quite a considerable amount. So I don't know if uh, I know they used to do grave robbing years ago. So I'm not sure if that's on this one. This looks like the oldest grave I could find. It is just a stone. Uh, the inscription I cannot read. The first lighting of the beak of the Queen's Golden Jubilee in June 2002. The next time it was lit is in 2005, the 200th anniversary of the death of Admiral Lord Nelson. Uh, the Queen's Diamond Jubilee in June 2012, it was lit. And then the 70th anniversary of VE Day in May 2015. So the hill stands at 122 metres high. It is made of limestone. The hill stands out as the area around it is relatively flat. So it makes it a landmark. A large part of the hill has been cut away by the attached quarry operated by the Breeding Group. In the centre of the picture is where the Quaich Memorial Beacon is, which is 20 miles away. And then looking across to our right, 
around these trees, but you see nothing. We're walking on the Cross Britain Way at the moment. The footpath is 280 miles long, also known as the Macmillan Way. It starts at Barmouth on the west coast of Wales and finishes in Boston in Lincolnshire. It's the alternative to Wainwright's coast to coast. Now you're gonna get through the gate. So just looking across the landscape now, we are at Park Pale. Park Pale is a wide ditch dug on the inside of a wide bank. Park Pales were introduced in the medieval periods to retain deer within parks and on estates in preparation for hunting. You're shy? Go on, you can eat it. I don't mind. No, you don't like it. Sorry. Picky. Walking with the cows. Probably a relative of Gertrude from one of my other videos. Hello. How are you? Some interesting horns you got there. You'll not be eating any matadors with them. He's got some wonky ones. Landscape Lake, created in 1845 from the old mill stream for Lord Melbourne. For great views of Melbourne, a walking trail surrounds the lake, and depending on the time of the day, the church can be seen reflected in the water. Oh my goodness. Can I have the mill here is on the site of the original mill that the market town of Melbourne got its name. This building, standing, now dates back to the early 17th century, but the original building set back to the 13th century. Coming to see me for some food? Afraid not. I'm on a diet, and so you should be. <coughs> Think you're just friendly, aren't you? This is Melbourne Hall. It is a beautiful stately home of the Coke family. The house originally built in the 12th century as a manor and owned by the Bishop of Carlisle and was altered in the early 17th century for Sir John Coke. In 1692, Thomas Coke began laying out the magnificent gardens that surround the house with a yew tree avenue walk and water features. The hall today is the work of Francis Smith of Warwick and his son, William Smith. The most famous owner of Melbourne Hall was William Lamb, the second Viscount Melbourne, who twice served as Prime Minister to Queen Victoria. Lamb was the husband of Lady Caroline Lamb, whose affair with Lord Byron caused a notorious scandal. The rectory at Melbourne, uh, looking at the chimneys and out, looks a bit Jacobean, so I'm guessing uh, late 16th century, early 17th century. And then looking across to our right, we have, we have Tyth Cottage. Robert Bakewell, a famous ironsmith, lived here. His workshop was within the cottage. In 1706, he moved here to work for Thomas Coke of Melbourne Hall. In the gardens to Melbourne Hall is the famous birdcage made of wrought iron and a magnificent piece by Robert Batewell, who also created the large wrought iron gates of Derby Cathedral. St. Michael and St. Mary's was built in 1120. An old story says that the church was built for the first bishop of Carlisle. When Henry I founded the diocese in 1133, he gave the church to Ethelwolf, the first bishop. Bishop Ethelwolf fled the turbulent area of Carlisle 
when it was captured by the Scots in 1136 and then he sought refuge here in Melbourne, in which he built the church in a grander style to suit his position as a bishop. In the 13th century, the bishops treated the church as a cathedral, as priests were ordained here. The church hasn't been really altered over the centuries, as has Norman carved tops on top of the human Roman style pillars. The church also still has its 12th century doorway. So guys, we are back in Melbourne, which is the end of the walk for today. It's an, been an enjoyable walk. It's been a great day. The weather's been superb and hopefully you've enjoyed it. So if you like to subscribe and you haven't, then if you like hiking, backpacking, long distance walking, and like to learn some tips and skills about the great outdoors, then uh, please consider subscribing. A like would be great and feel free to make a comment. So until the next video, I would like to say, Look after yourself, stay safe, and bye-bye hikers.